What's cracking? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your boy Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. Whether you're joining us from YouTube or podcast, I welcome you. This is gonna be a great episode. I have a lot, a lot, a lot of good stuff. Deep stuff. We're talking about my top 50 overall rankings for fantasy football season. These are half point PPR, but it's not very hard to sway them one way or another if you're in full PPR or standard. I did a top 30 video about a month ago to go rookies and, and changes and things like that. So I wanna just dive right into the video because there's a lot of information. I wanna get through this quickly and I wanna hit y'all with a ton of value. So let's get it popping. You're gonna see a ton of changes from the last video I made, which was over a month ago. Throwing this out there in the beginning. Throughout the summer, my ideas, theories, strategies, player analysis is going to change frequently if not daily, all the time, depending on new podcasts I listen to, blog posts I read, new information I find out, injuries, rumors, reports, all this shit, right? If you don't keep your mind open to that, you're not gonna be a good fantasy football player. So if I make a top five sleeper video, which I did a month and a half ago, there's a there's a 50-50 chance that by the end of August, I hate those guys at their, at their current ADP, right? So keep that in mind when you're watching these videos. And these rankings will be in the blog post on bigdogsfantasy.com if you want like a static shot of it. So let's get into the actual rankings. The top five are exactly the same as I had in my previous video, I believe, which is Bell, Gurley, Zeke, David Johnson, Antonio Brown. So I'm not gonna get into them. Uh, if you want more depth, you can always go into my running back rankings videos or anything like that where I break down the players individually. Also, I'm not getting into all 50 guys here just uh, general theories and maybe noteworthy or outliers on the ranking list. Last time I did this, I also did not have rookies in here. Now I do. You see the first one pop off on the board at number six, which is Saquon Barkley, right after Antonio Brown. Being the highly touted prospect he was coming out of Penn State and getting picked really early in the draft, there's gonna be a ton of discussion about Barkley uh, for fantasy football purposes this year. I think he is by far and away the best option at running back behind these first four guys who are like the elite tier of guys pretty much. He's right behind those those top elite guys at running back, right? Top talent. However, he hasn't done it in the NFL like they have, right? So he's going to naturally be a tier below because of the hesitancy to prove it first. While you have the other running backs who have proved it coming right after him, right? Kamara, Hunt, Fournette. They all have their individual red flags when it comes to them. You have Kamara who we don't know the volume workload he's going to get. You also have Mark Ingram who's going to come back from the suspension. So there are definitely some hesitations there in terms of picking Kamara is like a top six pick overall. Fournette is someone who dealt with lower leg injuries a ton. You don't know how involved in the passing game he's going to be. He's a lot less involved than, than Barkley is going to be for sure. And that's the thing about Barkley, guys. But he can definitely, certainly be up there in the 60 to 70 catch range. And I almost expect that in, in 2018. And, and if he does wind up with 60 to 70 catches on the year, any inefficiencies that you might expect coming out of the run game, right? Maybe lack of touchdown opportunities, Maybe the offensive line is shitty, so his yards per carry is going to be like 3.8 or 3.9. His 65 to 70 catches is going to more than offset that. So that's why I just love Barkley, because he's such a good all-around player. And we're kind of moving into the back of the top 12, right, when we're looking at Dalvin Cook, Kareem Hunt. Cook is obviously kind of integrating himself back into the Vikings offense. He missed almost all of last year. You also have Latavius Murray there, who kind of proved himself that he can do a lot and be an effective rusher, at least at, at, at a volume pace. So I think he, he probably earned a little bit of a role in Minnesota. I definitely don't think Cook, you know, Cook is going to be the guy there, 18, 18 plus touches a game, but there's just a couple question marks. Kareem Hunt going right after him. Hunt and, and Cook are pretty interchangeable for me here. Um, and I also would not be mad at you if you liked Kareem Hunt, where I have like Leonard Fournette. I could totally understand that. I think in terms of Cook and Hunt being squared off, I like the offense in Minnesota way more because they're they're a much better defense, right? Phenomenal defense there in Minnesota. They're gonna their game plan is going to be win with defense, rely on the running game. Whereas in Kansas City, that's not the case. They don't have a good defense, or they shouldn't have a good defense this year. And I think Hunt has a lot of weapons to compete with on that offense between Terry Kill, Travis Kelsey, newcomer Sammy Watkins, just to compete there. They did bring in Spencer Ware. They did bring in, you know, the Williams boys, Damian and Kerwin, I think it was. There's depth there at the running back position. Um, I'm not sure Andy Reid is a guy who naturally lends himself to, you know, using Kareem Hunt 20 to 25 times a game, which is something you want to see when you're when you're taking a guy in the top, you know, in the top 12. 
We look at last year, Hunt had six games where he had 13 carries or less. It's not exactly what you want as a workhorse running back, right? You know, I like him a lot. And like I said, I wouldn't argue against placing him there, but there are, I guess, discrepancies or a few problems I see with Hunt as like the fully featured back there. I do love his running style. I think like the intangibles speak for themselves and he is a beast, but you know, I'm not sure you're going to get consistency on a week to week basis just because of how Andy Reid calls that offense. What else? Okay. So we're looking at wide receivers. This is where things get interesting guys. So th this next like five, 10 minutes is going to be very, very, very valuable. So listen up closely. And I don't think anyone could really argue with my top three wide receivers. I have Antonio Brown, D hop, and then Odell. Beckham, but I think where people might see discrepancy is where or how early you're going to be taking these wide receivers. For me, it goes back to wanting a bell cow running back in the first round for the most part over a, I don't know what you want to call it, a bell cow or elite fantasy wide receiver. And I've shown this graphic quite a few times already this summer, uh, but for all the new people here, new people on the channel or the podcast, first of all, welcome. I love you. Secondly, check this chart out. If you're on the podcast, I would highly suggest come back to the YouTube. Just my name, Nick Ercolano, E-R-C-O-L-A-N-O, and you can check out all the, all the charts or on the blog. You know, if you're too lazy to figure out this chart, no worries. Your boy got your back like Cairo Pratt. It's showing what the average top five fantasy running back has scored on average each year. And it also shows the top five fantasy wide receiver and what they're scoring each year. These are individual player scores. So you could see just normally the top running backs are outscoring the top wide receivers just on a very level basis. Um, the only year that didn't happen was 2015 where one, all the running backs pretty much got hurt, all the top guys, and the wide receivers had the best year that they've had in you know in a long time. So it was a uh, it was a big discrepancy there, outlier of a year than the other years. That actually led to that you know the zero RB theory for 2016, which did not work out clearly. So basically, what I came down to was the fact that just top running backs in fantasy outscore top wide receivers. And I've shown this chart, and I thought it was a very good representation of why you should take running backs over wide receivers. But then I realized. That's not really a good representation of why you should be taking top running backs over top wide receivers. Like what happens if the wide receiver four scores 17 points a game and the wide receiver 14 only scores seven points a game? You're looking at a 10 point difference in points per game for, for wide receivers, despite there only being, you know, nine guys picked in between them. So while running backs on a plane might be more valuable, might score more points than wide receivers, we don't know the opportunity cost that you're missing out on if you're, if you're, not taking a top running back as compared to a top wide receiver. So the fall off from, you know, RB3, RB4, RB5, all the way down to RB15 might be smaller than the fall off from wide receiver to wide receiver, uh, you know, five to 15. So you might be actually missing out on more opportunity by not going with a higher wide receiver. So here's what I did. Take a look at this chart, guys. Take a look, let it sink in for a second. So I went back the last five years. I went back the last five years and I found the RB1, five, RB10, the RB15 in each year, all the way back to 2013, half PPR fantasy points per game. And I did the same thing with wide receivers, wide receiver one, five, 10, 15. And I wanted to see what the gap was between running back one and running back 15. And the same thing with wide receivers, because I wanted to see just how valuable those top elite running backs or top elite wide receivers are compared to the guys that you're getting a few rounds later and why you should invest heavy capital into to the elite running back, to the elite wide receivers. And what you see is exactly what I kind of expected to find. On average, the gap between running back one and running back 15 in terms of fantasy points per game is 9.4, guys. That's huge. It's still high at wide receiver at 6.3, but it's much less than the top running backs. And guys, this is the reason why people stream quarterbacks, why you should never pick kickers or defenses between the last couple rounds. Because while there's not of a that big of a gap between wide receivers and you know wide receiver five and wide receiver fifteen, the gap is so small when it comes to quarterbacks, when it comes to kickers, when it comes to defenses. Like quarterback six and quarterback sixteen are probably separated by two and a half fantasy points per game. See what I mean? So there's no opportunity cost in terms of waiting five more rounds to get a guy ranked 10 spots lower. And so I wanted to see what the gap was between running backs and wide receivers. And like I said, it's, it was as expected. It's much bigger for running backs. Um, and I also wanted to look at between running back five and running back 15 and wide receiver five and running back and run, wide receiver 15. So that in case there was an outlier, right? Like running back one might just be dominant year in and year out. And that would skew the numbers. But as you could see, it's a smaller gap, but it's still saying that those mid 
RB1s, early RB2s are more valuable in terms of points you're missing out on than wide receivers. So that doesn't mean go draft Jordan Howard over Odell Beckham. I would say use it more as a tiebreaker. If you have guys that are really, really close in value and you're not sure, and you know, you're not deciding on like position, you're not like, oh, I need to fill this slot, and it's just straight value, use that as a tiebreaker because the top running backs are much more valuable than the top wide receivers. I hope, I hope that makes sense to you guys. Again, those charts you could find on the website, bigdogsfantasy.com. What else you could find on the website? My complete draft guide. The 2018 BDGE Fantasy Football Draft Guide is available for pre-order right now. It will have my top 250 rankings on there overall. It'll have all my positional rankings broken down by tier. And I'm shooting for the first issue to be released around July 8th. That's like my target date right now. It is completely mobile, interactive. You can get a tablet, laptop, whatever. So it's gonna be updated weekly throughout the entire summer leading up to your draft. It's available right now for pre-order. So get it now at pre-order pricing. Again, it has all my rankings broken down by tiers. It has my top sleepers, my top busts. Awesome exclusive articles and videos that are not available on a YouTube channel that are exclusive to the draft guide. It'll have my BDGE Bible, which is a huge article I write each year that breaks down kind of position by position, an optimal draft strategy for you guys and, and just a lot of theory behind it. So very, very in-depth, very cool. So many more things that are gonna be involved in there. I just don't wanna waste all your time explaining it to you. So I'll link it here. It'll also be linked down below. Pre-order it now, get it before July 1st and you'll get a heavily discounted price. <sighs> Moving back into it, what else we got? What else we got? Wide receivers here. I think basically while I was doing my wide receiver rankings video, which I'll link here, I talked myself into moving Michael Thomas ahead of Devontae Adams. So I have him there. Uh, I also boosted Keenan Allen over Devontae Adams simply because of the Hunter Henry injury. You know, that obviously opens up a lot of targets for Keenan Allen, just that offense overall. So rip, 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 rip the God Hunter Henry. Moves Keenan Allen up. Devontae Adams is right there. In the wide receiver rankings video, you can hear me get very, very in-depth on, on both guys. So if you want to know more about my, my thoughts and my feelings on those guys, check that video out. Highly recommended. It'll also be linked down below. And I think we can move probably into that big block of running backs from 21 to 25. You see that? There's like five guys in a row starting off with Devonta Freeman. For me, he is arguably the highest upside here. Probably the highest floor of all these guys, um, but he's definitely on the best offense. So that's kind of why he's the tiebreaker there for me. And I wouldn't be mad about taking him a couple spots higher than I actually have him here. Uh, Joe Mixon obviously has that three down capability and will probably be used as a workhorse here and top five upside, uh, but he's probably in the worst offense here of all these guys. Um, and another caveat, you know, about being in a bad offense, guys. They don't have the ball as much. They don't run as many plays. And I was looking at the teams that have run the most plays from scrimmage, the guys who, you know, led the league in plays from scrimmage last year. It was, you know, the Patriots, the Jacksonville Jaguars, Philadelphia, teams like that. They were running around 1070 plays, right? 1,070 plays on the year. Since he ranked dead last, uh, around like 925 to 930 offensive scrimmage plays, which is uh, a drop off of like 150 to 170 plays on the year. Now, you could love Mixon as a talent and the fact that they upgraded their offensive line, which I do, but volume is usually the king when it comes to fantasy. And if he's not getting, you know, if that offense just is not rolling and they're not getting enough opportunity there, right? He's seeing. Their team overall is seeing 10, 12, 15 plays a game fewer than these other teams where you can get running backs and wide receivers and stuff from who have more opportunity there. That's kind of why, like, that's why I think Mixon is someone who's ranked below, you know, these elite, elite running backs that are even going top 10 and stuff. You're like, oh, Mixon's just as talented. Oh, he's going to be the workhorse, whatever. That team is just not, you know, they're not a, a great offense. Although I do think they're going to bounce back pretty heavily on the offensive side of the ball. But, you know, I, I like him right behind Devonta Freeman. And we move to, what, Jarek McKinnon and C-Mac. I love Jarek McKinnon here if you can grab him between pick, picks like 22 to 25. Him and Christian McCaffrey have amazing floors. If they could stay healthy, they have amazing floors. And I, I like McKinnon more just because he's going to be more involved in the running game. San Fran, that's probably, I don't know if they're going to be a better offense than Carolina, but I, I think they'll have just as many scoring opportunities, and if not more, and he should take a good portion of those goal line rushes. Now you have Jordan Howard right after him. He's kind of the polar opposite, right? I just prefer a guy with passing game upside as opposed to the, the, the main runner there because, you know, it's not game script dependent. These Jarek McKinnon and C-Mac are going to be playing regardless of if they're down or if they're up. And you can't say the same about Jordan Howard. So after that run of, you know, those five running backs right there, 
Nine of the next 10 rankings are wide receivers. But before we get into the wide receivers, I want to take a minute to thank the sponsors of today's episode. Fantasy Jocks. There goes my phone. I'm getting so excited. So much I love Fantasy Jocks. Dot com. They are the industry leader in fantasy sports gear for your league. I'm talking about championship belts. I'm talking about championship rings, trophies. They do draft boards. If you and your boys get together for your live draft, Fantasy Jocks has a great draft board, which me and my friends in my big money league have been using for the last four or five years. Guys, I swear, playing for something, playing for the belt is like the funnest thing you could possibly do in your league. Have everyone chip in on top of their buying, whatever it is, an extra five bucks, an extra 10 bucks, 12 bucks, depending on how many guys in your league. Grab yourself, do yourself a favor, grab yourself a belt or a trophy. They have sick Lombardi trophies that are big. We don't have one for our league yet because we got this bad boy. But, dude, I'm telling you, it is worth the money and it will make your league that much more enjoyable. You're playing for something, man. I'm trying to. I don't have the belt right now. I actually have to give this to our league winner still, which I've been saying for like two months now. But once you got the belt, man, there ain't nothing like it. So fantasyjocks.com, check them out. Linked below. Thank you for sponsoring the episode. As always, see, I'm married to the game. I can't even get the rang off. Let's get back into the wide receivers. Yep, okay, so clearly you have Doug Baldwin here, as you can just see by the rankings. He's my favorite of the bunch. You know, with Jimmy Graham and Paul Richardson gone, that opens up a ton of opportunity, both deep balls, right, for Paul Richardson, but more importantly, 37 red zone targets, 16 10 zone targets, and 16 of Russell Wilson's 34 passing touchdowns. I know they just signed Brandon Marshall. I have absolutely zero worries in terms of Doug Baldwin's outlook. He's 34 years old, coming off a serious injury. There's, the explosion is definitely not there. He's not going to be taking high volume of targets away from Baldwin by any means. If anything, he might be a good red zone target for Russell Wilson, which I think is fine. Uh, they have plenty of opportunity to give at that part of the field. So not worried at all about Brandon Marshall. If anything, this, this might move his, uh, his ADP back and you can kind of get him for a steal. But he is my top wide receiver out of all these guys. Then we have... You know, a, a big mix, a, a cluster of guys here. Mike Evans has the upside. Larry Fitz and Thielen both have great floors, especially in PPR leagues. I think a lot of this, depending on who you want to take here, which wide receivers of this group, uh, kind of have to do with your roster construction. What I mean by that is like, say you take Antonio Brown in the first round, right? I would probably be more okay taking a guy like Mike Evans at this point in the draft, or even like an Allen Robinson as my wide receiver too, if you had Antonio Brown, because he's a safe play who's going to get you consistent wide receiver fantasy points. Whereas if you have one of these guys that's your wide receiver one, you know, they have they have high ceilings, of course, but they also have low floors or are risky, right? So if things don't work out, then you're kind of screwed at the position. So I think it does matter about roster construction when it comes to a big, you know, like there will be a lot of different analysis done on all these wide receivers and who you should take and blah, blah, blah. But it's all personal to First of all, who you think you can get in the draft? Maybe you can get two of them if you want to wait on one of them. These guys, are, are their outcomes are very few and far between in terms of where they might end up ranking at the end of the year. So that's something I would think about. And yes, the only running back in the middle of those ten, nine wide receivers is Sony Michelle. I will state this now, and it will not change until we hear new reports and rumors and stats and stuff. Then it will change probably, like I said in the beginning of the video. But I'm probably going to go down with the Sony Michelle shit, man. For better or worse, he is someone I want on the majority of my fantasy football teams, man. I'm all in on him as a talent in the running back position. I'm all in on him in that aspect. The thing you guys can't forget is that the Patriots took him in the first round. Say what you want about it, but the Patriots were one game away from being Super Bowl champions again. And what did they do? They decided that the most important position for them to fill, other than the linemen they took in the first round a little bit before Michelle, was this running back need. That that was their biggest concern. And they took a guy who they thought was extremely talented in the first round. You don't see the Pats do that, but this is what they said, man. And this is why you can't forget that draft capital, man. This is why I love Sony Michelle. If they thought Michelle was just going to be an interchangeable running back in this backfield, why would they use a first round pick on him? Why not just sign a CJ Anderson? Why not just pick up someone else in the third or fourth round of the draft? They're not stupid. They know they could have done those things. So I think Michelle's going to be heavily, heavily, heavily involved in this offense. And I think the other thing you know to think about is what role is he going to have? Well, Burkhead and James White were there last year. He could easily have the Deion Lewis. I, one of two things, right? And I, I talked about this in my last video. You can see Michelle as someone 
who is Deion Lewis last year. Why not fit that role? A great runner, but can also be used in the passing game. You know, Deion Lewis was not the most used passing game back there, but he's certainly capable of it, which I think is Michelle's role. Worst case scenario, he's not really using the passing game. Why can't he be LeGarrette Blunt of 2016 when LeGarrette Blunt had 300 carries and went off for how many? 18 touchdowns? So Michelle has that, that 12 to 15 rushing touchdown upside just based on being in the Patriots offense, guys. When I was talking about how um, Mixon and, and the Bengals might not have a lot of opportunity based on their offensive plays from scrimmage, the Patriots year after year after year are one of the top teams in terms of volume of offensive plays. This is the Patriots we are talking about. He doesn't need a 60, 70% snap share to get a ton of opportunities. The opportunities are plentiful. And we're talking about opportunities where it matters for fantasy football, my friends. Sony Michelle, man, don't sleep on him. He's gonna dominate. And I'm very, 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 very Martavis Bryant high on him for 2018, man. Aaron Rodgers is the first quarterback off the board for me, and I believe he's the yeah he's the only one in my top 50 here. And to be quite honest with you, I don't even know if I would take him. Like if I was following my rankings and all every guy before him went off the board, and then it was Aaron Rodgers there, I probably still wouldn't take him just because the position this year is just so deep. And I think that's a strategy for most of you guys because the majority of you guys probably play in one quarterback leagues where you start one quarterback and it's four point per passing touchdown. So that makes them, well, one, them as in quarterbacks less valuable, but guys who don't score a lot of their points from rushing upside less valuable. You know, there's not much difference in fantasy points per game between quarterback four and quarterback 14, like I said. So Rodgers is, is, is my quarterback one this year. He's my favorite fantasy quarterback, but I'm also just not that high on him. So he might even be ranked lower. He'll, he'll be ranked lower probably next time I make this video. I'll probably do it once a month, like every 30 days I'll update it. Um, and then a couple guys that I've been kind of either cooling on or liking a little bit more and more. One guy is Rashad Penny. Definitely been taking him down a few notches as of recently. I don't know, the more I think about it, the more um, I'm trying to be realistic about the situation. And even though they use that first round capital on him, I don't see him playing heavily on third downs, if at all, right? He is, the worst part of his game is probably that as a pass blocker. He's also on a team that that has JD McKissick, that has CJ Proseis. JD McKissick literally was a wide receiver in college. So he's not the best pass catching back in the backfield. He's definitely not the best pass blocking back in the backfield. Why would they use him on third downs? It just doesn't make sense. So the, the more I think about it, the less I like uh, Rashad Penny from a workhorse standpoint. And then we have another running back who's been rising on my board, which is Lamar Miller. I was throwing a lot of hate at him in the beginning of the summer, but you know, when you look at it, it's just a true case of volume is king like a lot of fantasy opportunities, man. We have no idea really what's going on with Deonta Foreman with the coming back from his Achilles injury, right? There were reports that he might start the year on, on the pup list. Remember last year he came into the off season out of shape. So there's a possibility that that happens again because of the injury. They didn't draft or sign any free agent running backs. I think they re-signed Alfred Blue, but it's not really a, a big difference maker here. So it's hard to ignore Lamar Miller at this point, right? Even given his efficiencies, uh, even given like the lack of upside that he's had over the last couple of years, the volume is going to be there, man. Uh, I think Graham Barfield or someone tweeted it yesterday or the other day that he is like top six or seven in terms of snaps, in terms of touches, in terms of all this stuff over the last like three years for all running backs. So, you know, if Deonta Foreman is not ready to roll in the beginning of the year and reports are not good, then Lamar Miller is some guy that you, ju you just can't ignore, you know? Just, you just done can't do it. And plus, he was a lot more efficient with Deshaun Watson under center last year than he was without him. So obviously, that's a positive. He'll have Watson under center for him. Um, hopefully, that'll open up more running lanes for him. So Lamar Miller is a guy that, you know, like I said, you, your opinions are going to change on on fantasy players throughout the summer. And you can't, can't go into the year being like, I hate this guy, and that's it. No matter where his ADP goes, no matter, you know, what happens in that particular depth chart, you got to be able to shift your focus, you gotta be able to shift your analysis, rankings, and, and opinions. So I'm always here for that. And if some of you guys, you know, drop comments down below that I'm like, you know, that's a really good point. I have no problem admitting that and being like, yeah, you're right. I didn't think about that in my analysis. So guys, I learn from y'all as much as you learn from me. So keep commenting, keep sharing my stuff. Hit the thumbs up for this video if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you are new because this is the end of the video, unfortunately. But um, there will be plenty more. So again, subscribe to the channel if you are new because we'll be coming at you all summer as well as all season with <laughs> them big dogs got to eat fantasy football statistics. And I'll see y'all on Friday.